sticker on. I'm here. All right. Okay. I, I just don't want to manipulate my iPad. Okay. Oh, all righty. Well, welcome again to speaking historically. And we're doing the progressive era uh, uh, this time around. Uh, that goes from 1900. We'll, and we'll go to 1920 uh, today. Um, and I think everybody knows who I am. I know we're on YouTube. So um, my name's Louis Che and have a PhD in history from Florida State. And I teach history, uh, taught a class this morning uh, over at the University of Richmond's Osher Institute. Um, our outline uh, for today is we're going to be covering the election of 1912, a three-part uh, 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 con uh, contest, and then uh, the Democrats will win it and Woodrow Wilson will implement uh, his uh, philosophy of new freedom, it's called. And it has a lot to do with regulation of federal or the, uh, yeah, the Federal Trade Commission will be established. And of course, the Federal Reserve and unfortunately, uh, income taxes will be implemented at this time. Um, and there will be after the war, uh, at World War I, there will be significant labor unrest and uh, there will be uh, the, the Red Scare will uh, occur at that time as labor seems to be uh, in a uh, violent and aggressive mode. And we'll talk about why America turned away from progressivism in 1920 uh, and went back to a more conservative uh, approach. Uh, then we'll turn to foreign policy. Uh, we'll look at the open door policy that uh, uh, emerged about 1899 and how that has influenced our uh, foreign policy uh, uh, up uh, until our uh, even present time. And then we'll talk about, of course, the major uh, philosophies of uh, foreign policy, idealism and realism, uh, Theodore Roosevelt's approach, uh, the big stick, um, and um, also his involvement in Asia uh, and in, in European matters. And then we'll move to dollar diplomacy uh, by William Howard Taft, the economic penetration of uh, China uh, and Latin America. And then Woodrow Wilson's missionary diplomacy, trying to uh, promote and spread uh, democracy as well as capitalism. Uh, we'll look at uh, World War I that, that really shocked the progressive mindset. And we'll talk about that. Uh, I, then that'll be it. And we'll look at some discussion questions that I have and then open it up to uh, the floor for any questions and, and comments. But before we do start, I did want to say a word of thanks. Uh, this is uh, the end of our series. Um, and uh, first of all, thank you to Graystar, Van Lee, Jan Fisher, uh, Amy Drods for their very generous support of me uh, over these last nine months. And of course, Chris uh, Soul, who is uh, uh, taken up in January with Evoke Spark. They have been very uh, helpful and equally generous. And Joanne, who proofed all the slides so that we are, uh, you know, uh, have everything uh, spelled correctly and uh, uh, correct uh, um, uh, syntax on our, our slides there. And thanks for um, Walt and, and Joanne and, and Chris for being a great audience and those out there in YouTube uh, territory, uh, thank you for uh, attending. So let us turn now to uh, the election of 1912. Um, Taft is a Republican nominee and he controls the GOP apparatus and is able to have more delegates than Theodore Roosevelt. Um, and Taft runs on a platform of straight conservatism. Um, he opposes uh, Roosevelt's domestic progressive agenda. And Roosevelt then bolts the party and becomes the nominee of the progressive party, the Bull Moose Party. 
And he ran on a platform of new nationalism, he calls it, uh, a series of very left wing for the time uh, uh, agenda items, a minimum wage for women, prohibition of child labor workers, compensation when they are injured on the job, a federal trade commission that could control uh, uh, a big business with, and with sweeping powers. The Democrats uh, will nominate Woodrow Wilson, the governor of New Jersey, uh, who will speak in religious rhetoric uh, to the electorate. He represents the Christian capitalist wing of the progressive movement. Wilson wanted to unify and balance the system based on biblical principles. And he wants to ensure competition among the uh, big uh, trusts and big businesses of the era. He calls his program the new freedom, but really it's the idea of government being a referee to assure that all the players, which is the business and, and labor, are competing fairly. Now, Wilson is the anti-Brian conservative. Brian, of course, who had uh, run three previous times. <laughs> Now, uh, Wilson will win an overwhelming victory in the Electoral College with 6.2 million votes. Uh, Roosevelt got um, 88 electoral votes, 4.1 million votes. Taft gets eight electoral votes, 3.4 million popular votes. But you can see that the Republicans would have won if they were unified. They did outpoll uh, the Democrats. And, and Wilson only um, uh, got 42% of the vote, uh, but he had majorities in both houses of the Congress to get his agenda uh, done. Now, well, the first thing Wilson did was foolishly reduce the tariff in 1913. This is the first time uh, that the tariff is reduced since 1860. Um, it's called the Underwood Tariff and it reduces duties uh, down to 24 uh, percent. And uh, significantly, the farm products are on the free list. In other words, farm products are now competing with global uh, agricultural uh, products. Uh, now, this obviously helps the consumer like all of us here today. Uh, that makes products cheaper. Uh, we can get finished goods uh, with less expense from England and Germany but there is a revenue loss of $100 million per year. How do you make that up? You pass an income tax to make that money uh, balance. And of course, naturally, uh, this touches off a major recession in 1913. To no one surprised that knows anything about economics, you uh, are not protecting your products, you're not protecting your farm sector, and you're you're going to go into a recession. Unemployment, for example, in Massachusetts had 18.3%. In New York, 23% unemployment. On the farm, commodity prices dropped on global farm competition. Next thing Wilson did was create the Federal Reserve, a financial system uh, in that same year. The banking system at this time was disjointed with no central control. Again, a a laissez-faire approach. Uh, Wilson said banking had to be under the public, not private management, uh, which was just so risky. But Wilson deserves credit for striking a compromise. He, public, he privately allowed banks to continue operating uh, in, in, a, in a private stock holding arrangement, but regulated by this Federal Reserve Board that could uh, oversee banking control interest rates, and of course, print money. Uh, this setup uh, avoided bank runs, wild sep speculation, and instability. And the Federal Trade Commission is, um, the, is established, uh, which regulated the trusts, the big combines of the era. Uh, and the Federal Trade Commission Act of 1914 is seen as Wilson's anti-business uh, uh, effort, but really the, the principles underlying it 
uh, were uh, written by corporate leaders in response to a series of judicial and legislative decisions over the past 17 years. Um, and most important of these is the Trans-Missouri uh, Freight Case, the Hepburn Act of 1908, dealing with railroads, and the Standard Oil uh, Act, uh, or Standard Oil Case of 1911, which seemed to uh, not allow or, uh, or control competition. The, the net result of all these cases led to confusion about what big business was allowed and not allowed to do. And by way of background, by 1904, corporations had assets of $6 billion, and the top 4% of the trusts produced 57% of the nation's total uh, finished goods product. This is non-farm product. Roosevelt accepted the large corporation and sought to use the Sherman Antitrust Act to control bad trusts, which he defined as those that uh, put the needs ahead of social peace and class harmony. Uh, and again, that's an awfully subjective standard. Roosevelt said in his 1905 message to Congress that this is an age of com combination of, of uh, companies buying up other companies. And Roosevelt formed the Bureau of Corporations under the Department of Commerce to investigate corporate activities uh, and with the president's approval, publish their findings. And thus the Bureau could restrain unethical practices with the threat of bad publicity. However, businessmen wanted to revise, revise the Sherman Antitrust Law because it threatened the workings of big business and, and their profits. The National Civic Organization, a pro-business group, wanted a revision of the trust law um, to suit current business conditions, which means maximizing our, our um, uh, profits. But when Wilson came into office with that background, uh, he wanted to legislation to clarify what was legal and what was not. And the FC, FTC was established and was satisfactory to the corporation. So it had a, a marginal control over business, but business wrote it in such a way that they were not going to be uh, unduly restrained. It clearly spelled out what was unfair methods of competition and uh, gave the FTC the ability to investigate. So the FTC was a balance of regulation of trust, but did not totally eliminate them. As the election loomed, um, uh, it was um, not supported earlier. Uh, uh, the election of 1916, um, Wilson moved uh, very rapidly to the left and supported things that he had not supported or vetoed even earlier. For example, in 1916, he, he approved the, loan, the Farm Loan Act, authorizing federal government to regulate farm loans. And he signed into law the Child Labor Act, which restricted children from working until they were age 16. And he even agreed to increase the tariff uh, by 19. Uh, 17, um, because he wanted to win uh, this election. And of course, the war in Europe was raging at the time, and his slogan was, he kept us out of war. Uh, and all these actions gave Wilson the progressive vote and shifted uh, that uh, uh, Roosevelt uh, million votes to, to himself. He narrowly wins the re-election, 277 to 254 over uh, Charles Evans Hughes. And um, uh, he, he wins uh, with it with California. If California had gone for Hughes, Hughes would have been president. Um, and specifically the vote in the suburb in San Francisco and the uh, in suburbs of San Francisco uh, shifted the vote uh, about uh, a few thousand votes to give him uh, a narrow victory. Uh, when the war, when World War I ended, the employers tried to reverse the higher wage and union recognition that had come uh, with the drive for maximum wartime production, which had been in place. Uh, in reaction, there were a number of strikes 
in 1919. Uh, as you can see, there are uh, hundred, hundreds of them and in all about 4 million workers struck in 1919. In Seattle, 35,000 shipyard workers walked off the job to, to gain higher wages due to inflation. And conservative newspapers like the Los Angeles Times saw in the Seattle strike uh, communism right here, right now is what they said. At the same time as the Seattle strike, uh, textile workers in Lawrence, Massachusetts struck for a 48 hour work week. At the same time, wages uh, of, uh, were at what they were when they worked 60 hours a week. In addition, Congress was discussing the future of railroads, which had been under government control during the war. Railroad labor unions wanted to continue that permanent ownership of the rails by the federal government. What organized labor saw as what they called industrial democracy, uh, many Americans saw as workers grab for power. And moreover, there were a number of bomb scares in 1919. In Chicago, a plot was uncovered to place a number of bombs throughout the city. And um, the next day, former uh, Georgia senator had chaired the Senate Committee on Immigration, had a bomb sent to his home. His name was Senator Tom Harwick. A total of 36 prominent men had been sent bombs to uh, explode on May 1st, uh, 1919, and the in International Labor Day. And on June, 20, on June 2nd, mysterious bombs exploded in eight cities, including one on the Attorney General himself, uh, uh, Palmer uh, um, doorstep. And in Boston on September 9th, the Boston police went on strike for higher wages. And Governor Calvin Coolidge uh, broke the strike um, by bringing in the Massachusetts National Guard. Then on September 22nd, 350,000 steel workers went on strike for the eight hour day and the six day work week. In January 2nd and 3rd of 1920, the department arrested 5,000 people in 33 cities and in 23 states on charges of radicalism, subversion, being a communist. But the raids provoked widespread condemnation. Even Senator Warren G. Harding, a conservative Republican, criticized the actions here. By the spring of 1920, public opinion had turned against the, rage, uh, the raids as just too extreme and threatening to our civil liberties. Finally, in the middle of 1920, the inflation subsided, which had provoked all the strikes to begin with, uh, and the country went into a sharp uh, but short uh, recession. So why did uh, progressivism collapse? Why did America turn from progressivism in 1920? Um, well, first, were, of course, all those labor strikes, the threats from the bombing, the recession, uh, and progressivism had run its course. It, it was falling out of favor. It was out of fashion. Another reason was that Wilson failed to provide any, uh, to advance any concrete uh, proposals to uh, sustain the economy after the war boom. And neither did he develop a partnership between capital and labor to manage a peacetime economy. And the repressive actions of Attorney General Palmer uh, turned many against progressivism, seeming to be uh, a um, uh, coercive uh, action. And finally, uh, the passage of prohibition associated progressivism with construed, constru uh, uh, crusading uh, over-regulation, over-control of individuals' lives. America then turned back to laissez-faire, uh, but it is interesting to note here that they kept in place many of the regulations which controlled uh, much of the corporation economy that had uh, uh, undergone from 1900. So uh, that's, that's the end of my uh, presentation on the domestic side. I wanna turn to foreign policy 
uh, for the rest of our time uh, together uh, during the progressive era. Progressivism was nationalistic and semi-socialistic. Uh, it, it relied on the federal government to solve domestic problems and also uh, those present in foreign policy. In foreign affairs, there's a confidence in progress and the evangelical belief in the political and cultural superiority of the United States. The United States had a mission uh, to uh, bring democracy, capitalism, uh, a better life to the entire globe. And America's newly acquired empire had to be protected. Uh, so we wanted superiority in the Caribbean, a renewed emphasis in the Pacific, and an isthmus to connect them. Now, the method to achieve these goals was found in what is called the open door policy. The open door policy was created in 1899 um, and 1900 by Secretary of State John Hay. And at first demanded for equal uh, economic access to the 400 million person China market. That's what the concern was with China, that other na foreign nations were dividing and freezing out American uh, uh, ability to sell their products uh, in that country. And, the re and we recall, again, the recession of 1992, the depression of 93 to 98, uh, the answer was to seek new markets. And uh, that would be uh, the way to avoid labor unrest, such as the Homestead Act and the iron and steel uh, uh, unrest that occurred in the 1890s. And in 1894, there was Coxey's Army marching on Washington, a group of, of, of miners from Nevada and uh, uh, Montana, uh, Wyoming, uh, as well as farmers. Uh, and of course, in 1894 was the Pullman train strike where the uh, trainmen were, had their wages cut and uh, had a number of layoffs. And the State Department said that access to the China market would secure equality of opportunity to the United States and would doubtless result in immense gain to our manufacturers. And that means work for our workers. And as I mentioned, Germany, England, Japan, and Russia were carving up uh, ports in uh, uh, China. Uh, remember, uh, Shanghai went to Germany, um, uh, uh, England got Hong Kong, uh, and uh, uh, Japan had uh, uh, control of another uh, port around uh, the area of Korea there. And, um, and so we were being uh, uh, eliminated from this huge market. The, the second note, uh, it, was, it was connected to this in 1900 that demanded uh, territorial integrity of China so that it would not be dismembered. Uh, and the, the technique then of the open door was expanded to Africa, Europe, and Latin America so that the United States businesses uh, could have access to these countries. Uh, Te Theodore Roosevelt said, I regard the Monroe Doctrine as the equivalent to the open door in South America. So according to leftist historians, the open door policy was designed to win victories without wars. And they also uh, asserted that it derived from the uh, belief that American economic power could make uh, poorer, weaker countries uh, fit into pro-American mold and buy our products. Leftists also point out that such a policy was certain to create foreign policy crises in these countries as American investments and trade would be attached to the status quo in those nations. Cuba and later in Vietnam would be illustrations of the problems that the open door policy would generate. Uh, to be fair, though, critics, uh, uh, realistic critics, uh, pointed out that only 5 to 10 percent of the gross national product, though, was based on foreign trade. Other factors were involved, strategic, ideological, for example, spreading democracy, capitalism, uh, also 
uh, played a role. And when we talk about realism, uh, we have to uh, talk about uh, the, the two ways of looking at foreign policy, idealism and realism. Um, uh, idealism is when you make decisions based on international affairs, uh, on ideas or concepts. Uh, it comes from biblical teachings in the Old Testament. Uh, God will do the fighting, as you see in the book of Joshua. And in the New Testament, of course, Jesus is an outright pacifist who says to love your enemy, turn the other cheek, uh, uh, do not use violence, and he lived uh, that way. Idealism to the idealists like Woodrow Wilson, peace comes from treaties, negotiations, international uh, uh, organizations such as the League of Nations. Uh, I, idealists, I, I think, are Jesus himself, Woodrow Wilson, Franklin Roosevelt, George W. Bush will be uh, an idealist, isn't he? What he wanted to do is bring democracy to the Middle East. Albert Einstein is an idealist and pacifist. And of course, Robert Oppenheimer uh, became a pacifist, although he did develop the atomic bomb. But on the other hand, you have realism. Uh, realism looks at foreign policy from the vantage point of power and geography. How many divisions do you have? How many aircraft carriers do you have? Uh, is the way realists uh, evaluate the international situation. Uh, can our supply line sustain the effort? Realists see peace coming from a balance of power, a balance of terror, a balance of fear. Uh, and that's because the international state system is based on fear and self-interest. And that is based because there is no acceptable international judiciary to decide international disputes. Each nation then as its own sovereignty and acts as it sees fit. Realism is the reigning philosophy uh, right now, and it has been since, uh, I would say, December 7, 1941. Uh, realists include uh, George F. Kennan, the author of the containment policy, all the U.S. presidents during the Cold War, Henry Kissinger, Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, uh, a younger one is Kenneth Waltz, um, W-A-L-T-Z. Um, these are all realistic uh, thinkers. Uh, now, Roosevelt's outlook reveals an even more significant aspect of the progressive integration of ideological and economic expansion. Uh, TR wanted to extend the Anglo-Saxon idea of constitutionality, uh, democracy throughout the world. He wanted American business and military supremacy to promote civilization. And of course, the civilization as he understood it is the American consumer uh, society. Roosevelt said it was America's duty toward the people living in barbarism to see that they are freed from their chains and we can free them only by destroying barbarism itself. The inherent requirement of economic expansion coincided with religious and reformist drive to make the world again along American lines, a consumer uh, society uh, uh, that revolves mainly around uh, the automobile. As they existed, the underdeveloped countries were poor, particularistic, tradition bound, uh, and that situation handicapped business enterprises as these third world countries were not organized to mesh with modern industrial economies. It's great to have uh, washing machines and sewing machines, but you need electricity and infrastructure to do that. You need roads to be built and all of that uh, has to be, uh, de be developed. So it was necessary to change these nations in certain ways to harvest the fruit of the investment uh, in these nations. So you had to extend loans so that they can build roads and build telegraphs and electric grids. Uh, he, they, these had to develop as poor 
people cannot buy goods and services exported by wealthier industrial countries. So if you're going into Uganda and, and selling washing machines, you've got to be able to afford it. So the answer is to loan Uganda money so that they can purchase these items. Uh, again, no income, no purchases, no purchases, no trade, no trade, no prosperity in America, and no increase in the standard of living uh, in these poor countries. It was the reasoning that uh, was utilized. Progressive uh, Robert LaFollette said that taking the Philippines will enable America to conquer its rightful share of that great market now opening in China. Further, he said American expansion to the Philippines has made those people free. Now, uh, in terms of the Western Hemisphere, Roosevelt was suspicious of Germany, which he saw as an economic and military threat. Germany was the strongest European economy and military at the time. Uh, and this, of course, uh, helped Anglo-American friendship. We uh, were dropping our animosity towards England as a result of Germany's rise. The hay ponce uh, Treaty of 1901 allowed the U.S. to build a canal and fortify it. Uh, but Colombia, which, were the, which controlled what is now Panama, wanted more money than the U.S. was willing to provide, and Colombia wanted sovereignty over the canal zone. And Roosevelt lost patience with the negotiations with the Colombians and facilitated a, a revolution to have Panama independent. It just so happened that a warship uh, conveniently put in the Colón uh, the day before the revolution in Panama and blocked com uh, col uh, Colombian troops from reinforcing their outnumbered troops in what was the province of Panama. In addition, TR was concerned about European governments intervening in the domestic affairs of weak and Latin America, uh, uh, South American and Latin American nations. For example, in 1902, Venezuela had borrowed heavily uh, uh, from Europe, uh, but refused to pay their obligations. And Germany, uh, Great Britain, and Italy blockaded the, the Venezuelan ports. And TR insisted on arbitration and threatened to send uh, Admiral Dewey's task force to Venezuela if, Argent if arbitration was not guaranteed. And the same situation occurred in Santo Domingo in 1903. Again, these countries are investing money so that these nations can buy products from these industrial nations of Germany, uh, France, uh, and uh, Great Britain. And U.S. resolved this one by appointing an American uh, to manage the finances of that nation. And in 1904, Roosevelt issued the, what is called the Roosevelt Corollary to the Mo Monroe Doctrine. It said the U.S. had a right to intervene in the Western Hemisphere if the nation failed in its obligations to provide uh, order. And turning to Europe uh, and Asia, uh, U.S. had significant ties to Asia, uh, much more trade with, a with Japan and China than, than any of the Latin American nations. Now, in February 1904, the balance of power shifted. Japan had sunk a, a Russian Pacific fleet, first time a non-European country uh, had defeated a European country, and the balance of power was threatened. Uh, TR arbitrated a settlement, uh, and these were the terms that Port Arthur uh, which was the Japanese area, uh, Manchurian rails, and Korea would go to Japan. China would keep Manchuria. Uh, Russia would get half of Sakhalin Island. U.S. would get the open door to China, and Roosevelt would get the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, far more divisive, though, was the question of Asian immigration. We just saw an episode there in Atlanta of violence against Asians, and uh, the United States has always been a very uh, anti-Asian in, in many of its policies. In, in 1902, Congress restricted Chinese laborers uh, from, uh, for an indefinite period of coming into the country because they were driving wages down of 
uh, working people. In 1906, San Francisco uh, City ordered all Japanese, Chinese, and Korean children in segregated schools. And TR intervened uh, with an agreement was worked out that allowed both governments to restrict unwanted immigrants. But we both know that, or all of us know, that uh, there was no uh, great restriction of Americans going to those uh, uh, Asian countries. It was um, uh, the United States that was restricting uh, immigration. Uh, more congenial, though, was the Ru Takahira Agreement in November of 1908. Uh, here, both countries pledged the open door in China, the status quo in the Pacific, and the guarantee of Chinese territorial integrity. Another factor in a progressive area relationship I should mention is the ma uh, missionaries. American religionists were concerned about China and, and both Catholic and Protestant churches uh, sent missionaries there. Uh, one clergyman said there was a great Niagara of souls passing into dark China. As American missionaries grew to about 500 uh, with a total student body of 17,000 in their church schools in China, uh, the missionaries demanded formal support and protection from the US government. And, and while they did get the same support as business groups got, uh, they evolved into a complementary force for economic and ideological expansion. Economic expansion and trade were seen as allies to the missionaries. Missionaries shifted from an emphasis on the horrors of hell to concern for practical reforms as a lever for conversion. So sanitation, water purification, highways uh, were uh, uh, promoted by missionaries. And these religionists stress the need to remake the underdeveloped societies again more in the image of the United States. Missionaries began sounding more and more like politicians advocating for social changes, which again integrated well with American economic interests. In terms of Europe, turning to Europe, uh, once again, TR was a force for conciliation. In 1905, there was competition between France and Germany for political and, com and commercial dominance in uh, Morocco, again, trying to get a, a market in that African country. England and France had just signed a dual alliance aimed to control Germany. And Germany retaliated by recognizing rebels in the Moroccan uh, country that wanted their independence from France. And it almost brought on World War I at that point. But uh, the German Kaiser appealed to Roosevelt to resolve it, and Germany agreed to the open door in Morocco. Morocco got its sovereignty, France got control of the police force, and uh, the open door once again is key. Here's what Secretary Elihu Root said. It was vital to American interest that the door being open should lead to something and that the Moroccan people shall be made to profit by the advantage of these proposed reforms. And uh, William Howard Taft and, and his approach uh, it was called dollar diplomacy. He shifted from the use of force to investment. Uh, and again, it was a, uh, another variation of open door. Taft helped American bankers to gain place in financing railroads in China. Now, why is that important? Well, uh, again, if you can get your products to the port, uh, again, there, there's no roads in China. There's no trucking. Uh, how are you going to get the uh materials, the, the supplies, the products uh, to the consumer in, in, uh, inside of, of uh, uh, China. And you need railroads to do that. So uh, Taft arranged for bankers to loan money to China so they could build railroads. He said about China, I regard the diplomatic position at Peking as the most important position to fill. Taft said his objective was a practical and real application to the open door policy. In 1911, Nicaragua default, defaulted on its loans. 
and Taft arranged for U.S. bankers to manage the Customs Department to avoid foreign intervention. March of 1913, Taft sent Marines into Santo Domingo to stabilize that country and protect American investments there. They stayed till 1924. And the goal was to develop, again, exports and trade so that they could buy our products. Now, the left-wing critics point out the need for foreign markets to keep the domestic economy flowing. But and on the other side, uh, critics, uh, right-wing critics point out that uh, it wasn't that uh, uh, an enormous amount, just 5 to 10% of the U.S. GNP was tied up with foreign trade. And turning to Wilson, Wilson, again, is a Christian capitalist Democrat. He said in speeches, non-intervention uh, and self-determination in Latin America uh, should be uh, advocated and rejected TR's interventions and Taft's dollar diplomacy. But in fact, in the same years, 1913 to 1917, the U.S. intervened on a large scale in Latin America and South American countries. Uh, here, the rationale was to help Latin America fend off foreign po powers and, uh, and internal uh, disorder. In Nicaragua, Wilson arranged a treaty which allowed the U.S. to control Nicaraguan uh, finances, similar to what Taft had done in Venezuela. Wil Wilson's missionary style was also evident in Asia. Uh, with respect to the Philippines, Wilson said they should get their independence just as soon as Americans could instruct Filipinos on the proper way to have independence and a constitutional government. Um, Wilson said, when men take up arms to set other men free, there is something sacred and holy in the warfare. I will not say peace as long as there is sin and wrong in the world. Wilson's type of moral imperialism subverted his support for uh, self-determination. On the one hand, people had a right to be free, but Wilson judged whether or not they chose freedom by the way he defined it. Wilson's crusading idealism and hard-headed economics is found in the handling of the China loan situation, which, as I said a few minutes ago, Taft had started. Wilson took office. The bankers involved in the China loan wanted assurances from Wilson for his support. But Wilson rejected the plan and is often viewed as Wilson's desire to respect uh, China's self-determination. But Wilson did not want to enter into this multi-nation effort, but preferred that America have a controlling voice in the loan, which was not possible. So he pulled it out. Wilson also wanted to appeal to progressives who viewed the loan as one of Taft's dollar diplomacy actions, which many progressives opposed. And finally, uh, the progressives going to, into World War I. For the first time in history, uh, world powers had arisen whose motherland was not in Europe. The United States and Japan emerged during a progressive era as world powers. And their movements and their very presence would instant, instantly involve the influence of the European balance of power. The outbreak of World War I stunned Wilson and all progressives. They thought war was antiquated, a barbaric way. People uh, had gone beyond that, and they were rudely uh, uh, educated on, on realism. The key question then was, how would the country uh, reestablish its relationship to the world economy, and particularly with the belligerents who purchased 77% of American exports? America was tied uh, to England and France. We couldn't get through uh, to Germany uh, because there was a blockade. So our neutrality was, was in question. But Wilson's answer was neutrality, and it was wise because... Uh, the, uh, the, the recession that he created was lifted because of the demand for finished goods and agricultural products uh, as a result of the war, which uh, had been going on since Napoleonic times. 
Uh, in addition, the large number of immigrants that had come into the country uh, made neutrality the best policy. There was a large number of Irish that didn't want us to support England. There was a number of Germans that didn't want us to uh, get involved in anti-German warfare. So uh, those two groups uh, uh, made it uh, practical not to uh, take a side. And as the election of 1916, Loom Wilson knew that the main reason he won was because Republicans had split the progressive vote. And, Bruce, and uh, uh, Wilson uh, uh, courted, as we saw uh, a few minutes ago, that uh, the uh, uh, progressive uh, reforms and laws, uh, he advocated to get that vote and that worked. Now, Roosevelt was incensed that the U.S. had not entered the war, and he joined with Republicans and, of course, made this election very close. And as I said, Wilson shamelessly wooed swing progressives and enacted a number of laws they had vetoed previously. As the war continued on, Wilson's neutrality amounted to more war orders and prosperity uh, and loans to England and France. And this strategy sustained economic growth, but again, tied us to the uh, prosperity uh, uh, with the involvement with the allies. However, Germany's decision in February 1917 for all out submarine warfare threatened to defeat the allies. And this ended Wilson's hope for applying neutrality to Europe and forced the United States eventually to enter the war. Supplying American and allied armed forces meant mobilizing the economy for war on a gigantic scale. Wilson created the War Industries Board, the, for, the Food Administration, the War Labor Board, and other agencies to coordinate production, control wages, and prices. And uh, many Americans saw what, what the government, when it puts its mind to it, could do. In January of 1917, Wilson addressed Congress uh, with a speech called Peace Without Victory, but that went nowhere. On February 1st, Germany uh, instituted unrestricted submarine warfare. On March 1st, uh, uh, Wilson found out about the Zimmerman telegram. This was a uh, effort, foolish effort by Germany to uh, enlist Mexico uh, in its war uh, and promised if they, Mexico entered the war on the side of Germany that uh, Germany would guarantee that uh, the states that um, Mexico lost in the Mexican war would be returned to Mexico, be California, uh, Texas, uh, New Mexico, and Arizona. Preposterous, but it outraged Americans and outraged Wilson. Then on November, March 16th, three merchant ships were sunk. And at that point, Wilson had had enough and went to Congress with the declaration of war. His justification was that the war would be made safe. The world would be made safe for democracy. After the war, the U.S., of course, was in the dominant economic and military position. And Wilson threatened a separate peace if his 14 points were not adopted. Those 14 points, uh, some of them dealt with uh, open diplomacy, popular sovereignty, nuclear uh, new, neutral rights on the seas, uh, no tariffs, and of course, establishment of a League of Nations to guarantee the peace uh, in the future. But Wilson maladroitly had no senators and absolutely no Republicans uh, with him at the Paris Peace Conference. And Wilson's treaty was opposed both by the realists, because it avoided the uh, balance of power and just uh, 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 advocated for all-out democracy in Eastern Europe. And the idealists were against it because it, it moved the U.S. from a tradition of isolationism. And ultimately, the Senate rejected the treaty. And, and this form of progressivism, uh, international involvement, uh, uh, was uh, finally uh, defeated in the election of 1920. So that, that ends up uh, um, my discussion of uh, progressivism. Uh, just a few conclusions. Uh, it was the major turning point or a major turning point in American history. Uh, 
It marked the close of the age of laissez-faire. Uh, now the question would be what degree of intervention we would have in the future. Progressivism was the way Americans cope with the large organizations, great corporations, and labor unions. In foreign policy, uh, progressivism believed in um, uh, overseas economic expansion to avoid domestic unrest at home and promote economic growth there as well. The open door was the strategy that, and the technique that linked domestic political and economic policies and international relations. So just a few discussion questions. Um, uh, wh why do you think the progressives were more effective than the reform movements of the 1890s, which went nowhere? I might. Yeah, uh, Walt, you're muted. You have to unmute there, Walt. There you go. Okay. <clears throat> I think it was probably a coalition of these disparate groups and their various agendas sort of came together. Uh -huh. So they were more focused. Uh, ah. Yeah, more organized uh, yeah. the progressives were, and uh, than the uh, uh, you know conspiracy theorists of the of yeah. the populist movement. Yeah, and of I course, think. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt, Teddy was Roosevelt, a big player. Yeah, absolutely Even right. Some yeah. uh, figurehead and leadership. Yeah, yeah, he is the big factor in 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 that because he he took the lead. He embraced it, and the populist had nobody like him, and. And uh, he was uh, a real force. So I, I think those, uh, those are the major reasons. And, and again, uh, uh, going back to a, 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 a more fundamental truth is that it's when times get better that the biggest changes occur. It's not when you're in the depths of a recession or a depression. It's when things are coming up that you're going to see uh, their, your biggest, uh, biggest prospects. Um, uh, of the progressives, who do you think was more effective, uh, Wilson or Roosevelt? Well, in terms of uh, long-term implementation, probably Wilson. Yeah, yeah, well, Wilson uh, had, did a lot, didn't he? Yeah, he was. Yeah, he did, but he piggybacked on uh, Roosevelt and set it in motion. Yeah, he did a yeah. lot of it. Right. Right. Yeah. Roosevelt was uh, promoting it and, and, and advocating for it. But uh, you have to give Wilson uh, credit here. He he implemented it and uh, uh, against uh, his better judgment. But he was uh, uh, shrewd enough to realize that he had to have that progressive vote to win in 1916. Uh, and who do you think was the greater imperialist, um, Roosevelt or Wilson? I would, I would certainly vote for Roosevelt. Certainly he wanted, uh, among other things, coaling stations for his great white fleet. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, we, we, Wilson, uh, sir, you know, he intervened and I didn't mention about Mexico and, and because of our time, but uh, he intervened in Mexico, all these other states. Uh, and uh, uh, he was uh, just as, uh, uh, expansionary as Roosevelt was. They both were uh, involved in um, imperialistic actions. Well, um, we come to the end. It's, it's been really great um, uh, working with you all. Um, thank you so much. I, I certainly in, enjoyed our last nine months. We've covered a lot of ground and uh, um, I hope to see you again uh, in the future. Uh, thanks. Again, Chris, it was great working with you. Uh, hope to see you again. Joanne, thanks for all your help. Walt, your comments, uh, always appreciate it. All right. Thank you, Lou, and uh, best wishes. Well done. Thank you all. Very thorough. Bye-bye. <laughs> thanks, Louis. Take care. Okay. Bye-bye.